Good evening and welcome back to our study of the letter to the Romans. I hope you've had a good week and that everyone in your family has stayed well to this point. And please know um, if you have any struggles, any prayer requests, you can email those to me and we will be happy as a church to pray for you and to pray for your family as well. Well, let's dig in tonight. And as we begin, I want to remind us where we left off last week in chapter 1. As we ended in verse 32, we were in what's known as the dark section of Romans. And Paul was addressing the things that are sin in our lives. And the reason he's spending this time on sin and going to spend a good bit of time on it is because we need to understand, and the Romans reading the letter needed to understand sin in order to understand their need and our need for Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. Well, last week, as he ended in 32, he says this, And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things, and he's just given a whole list of things that are sin, not a complete list, but a significant list, of things that are worthy of death, he said, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. Well, as we begin tonight, Paul is going to continue on that theme, but he's going to talk about judging and whether we should or should not judge, how we participate or don't participate. And so he's just told us we're not to give hearty approval to sin, but he's about to tell us something that seems to contradict that, and we're going to look at it in detail. As we begin, I want to take a moment and do just a little role-playing with you, and we're going to pretend that we're in a restaurant together, sitting at a booth, and I'm on one side, and I'm going to do all the talking and the chatting. I'm just going to bend your ear, and you're sitting on the other side of the booth, And my conversation might go something like this. I can't stand Phil. You know why? He is always criticizing other people. Isn't that Jennifer sitting over there? Do you see that? Oh, my goodness. She has a glass of wine. Do you? Does she not know her body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? She's defiling the temple. And besides that, that stuff, It's poison. I just can't believe it. Oh, my goodness. Are you going to finish that hamburger that's on your plate? Oh, it looks wonderful. Do you mind if I have the rest that you don't finish? And, oh, you're not going to eat your chocolate cake. Wow, I would love to have that. Do you mind? Oh, waiter, waiter, could you bring me another malted milk over here? This is so delicious. And also, Just another order of fries, if you don't mind. That would be great. Don't you just love eating here? The food is so wonderful. Well, did you catch it? I mean, we all do it, don't we? We're quick to criticize and cast blame and judge others. And yet, slow, as someone said, slow as a snail on ice to catch the problems with ourselves. Chuck Swindle, as he introduces this section, said this, The guilt of the holier-than-thou club is Paul's focus in Romans chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. So let's begin with what Paul says. Therefore, he says, you are without excuse. And he's talking to you and me. Every man of you who passes judgment. For in that you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge, practice, practice the same things. Now, you're going to hear that word practice throughout Romans, and that's important. For you who judge, practice the same things. So who is Paul talking to here? Well, some commentators say that he's talking to the Jews because of their practice of legalism. But when I read this in the context that it's written, I understand My understanding is that he's talking to the church in Rome, to believers. And Paul, in this particular verse, does not single out the Jews. And he's going to mention Jews and Gentiles together on over in verses 9 through 11. So it looks like Paul is 
talking to everybody, to both groups, but I think he's talking particularly to believers. So think about this. What are some ways in which you and I rationalize our own sin? See if this sounds familiar. Oh, I'm not argumentative or divisive. I just have strong convictions. Me? An anger problem? No way. I'm just enthusiastic. Come on. That's not lying. That's salesmanship. It's just part of doing business. Pornography? Don't be ridiculous. I'm just appreciating art. God made me this way, so it must be okay. Ever used any of those things to rationalize your sin? Rationalizing or renaming sin, however, does not change the fact that sin is still sin. And sin brings God's righteous judgment. Now, we don't like to talk about judgment, but that's exactly where Paul takes us in this section. And we cannot leave that out of the Bible unless we want to throw the whole thing away. Because throughout Scripture, we also see, we see God's love and mercy and grace and forgiveness, but we also see God's righteous judgment. Verses 2 and 3. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. And do you suppose this, O man, when you pass judgment upon those who practice such things, and you do the same yourself, do you suppose that you will escape the judgment of God? So we can't expect God to judge others and then overlook our guilt when we commit the same sins. And just because the judgment doesn't come immediately, that does not mean that it's not going to come at all. Some of you went through the Revelation study with me and are in the Revelation study in Ricky's class, and I think I mentioned this last week. Ricky has recently talked about the bold judgments of God. Has it happened yet? No. But it is coming. It's coming. So what Paul is saying is, is Paul saying in these verses that we should never confront anyone about legitimate sin in their life? Should we never say anything? No, that's not what Paul's saying. If we go back in Scripture, let's look at Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. In those verses, it says, Judge not, lest you be judged. But in verse 5 in Matthew 7, it says this, You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So what it means is we need a time of spiritual in, introspection before we ever start the process of spiritual confrontation. You know, what, what would happen if we, the church, never confronted sin? What would happen as a parent if you never confronted the things that your child was doing that were wrong? What would happen as parents if we never taught our child and talked to our child about not lying? What if they learned to lie over and over as children? What good would that serve them as they became adults? So it's not about not noticing or not confronting sin, but there is a proper way to do that. And we have to deal with what's in our own heart first. And we also need to remember how Jesus, he set the example for us with the woman who was caught in adultery. He was very loving. He was forgiving to her daughter. Your sins are forgiven. But he said this, go and sin no more. With the woman at the well who'd had multiple husbands and was apparently living with a man at that time, Jesus was extremely kind, but he acknowledged to her of her flaws and her mistake. But then he went on he used her to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he sets a beautiful example of us. Judging and condoning sin are two different things, though, and we need to remember that. Judgment, actual judgment, this judgment unto death that Scripture's already talked about, is not something that you and I have the right to do. 
We don't have that authority. That authority and that, that position is God's and God's alone. But we do have a responsibility not to give hearty approval to sin. So he goes on in verse 4 and says this, Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads to repentance? So what does this mean, to think lightly of God's kindness and goodness? Well, quoting commentator John Stott, here's what he said. He said, Sometimes in a futile attempt to escape, the inescapable, namely God's judgment, we take refuge in a theological argument that's incorrect. We appeal to God's character, especially to the riches of his kindness, his tolerance, and patience. And we maintain that he is much too kind and long-suffering to punish anybody, and that we can therefore sin with impunity. We even misapply scripture to our advantage and quote such statements as, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. But he goes on to say, this is kind of manipulative, a manipulative theology that shows contempt for God, not honor. It's not faith, it's presumption. So then what does the kindness of God mean? What does it lead toward? And this is what's so important. The kindness of God has a purpose. And that purpose, according to verse 4, is that it leads you to repentance. That's the goal of God's kindness. It's not hearty approval, but the kindness is to lead us to repentance. What if our kindness led someone to repentance? It's intended, his kindness is intended to give people space to repent, to reflect, not an excuse for sinning. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says this, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but wanting all to come to repentance. That's his slowness. God's restraint of judgment, again, is not and should not be taken as permission to sin. He's giving sinners time to come to him and receive his forgiveness in Christ Jesus. But, and we're about to see in this next verse, that patience does not last forever. Verses 5, 6, and 8 but because of your stubbornness, Paul writes, an unrepentant heart, you were storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation." And so what he's talking about here is his judgment and his wrath will come. And we see that again in the book of the Revelation. And let me encourage you, if you've not ever read that, please don't be afraid of it. It's not a book meant to scare us to death, but it's meant to be a book that prepares us to get ready for his coming and for what's to come. And it also reveals to us the majesty and glory of God the Father and his son, Jesus Christ. It's a book of actual great encouragement. So, according to these verses, what are the consequences of not accepting his kindness? Well, we're storing up wrath against ourselves. God is going to give to each according to what they have done. There will be wrath and anger. And in verse 7, he says, To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give them eternal life. So here we see the consequences for those who accept his kindness. He'll give eternal life. We need to remember this. Sin has to be paid for. There is a price. Romans 6.23 says this, For the wages 
of sin is death. So it is either going to be paid for by the wages that Jesus Christ earned on the cross or by what you and I earn by our own works. Whose wages do you want? I don't know about you, but I am so thankful for the wages that Jesus earned on the cross. And when I accepted him as my Savior and Lord, his wages were credited into my spiritual bank account so that I don't have to stand before God at the judgment seat on my own merit. I stand there on the merit of Jesus Christ and what he earned. Now, I don't know if you noticed in verse 6 that it says God will judge each person according to his deeds. And I want to go, wait a minute. Doesn't salvation come by faith alone? Well, absolutely. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, lest anyone should boast. No one can be saved by trying to live a better life or doing enough good works. We'll see this in Romans 3, 20, in Galatians chapter 3, verse 11, in Titus 3, 4 through 7. Yet, yet in both the Old and New Testament, it constantly speaks about judgment according to works. And we see this in Jeremiah 32, 19. You're going to see this in Matthew 16, 27. So how are these two truths compatible? Judgment by grace and judgment by works. Well, the answer is this. True faith produces good works naturally. In the same book, Ephesians, where I just quoted, for by grace you have been saved, Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we could walk in them. I find that so exciting. He's already prepared beforehand good works for you and me. Our good works are the evidence that we belong to Jesus Christ. Faith comes first, and then the good works flow out of the faith in Jesus Christ. James is, uh, has a famous uh, chapter that deals with this topic. It's James chapter 2. In verses 17 and 18, he says this, Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. True faith produces good works. Once you ask Jesus Christ into your heart as Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to live in you, and those good works will naturally just pour out of you because it is the Holy Spirit that's doing that in and through you. He goes on to say in verse 9, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil. Now let me stop there and back up a minute. If you were in the Revelation study, we dealt with what's known as the section that deals with the white throne judgment. This is the judgment of those who have not received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And they are judged according to their works, and their judgment is unto death. Prior to that, we looked at the judgment of believers. And what we we saw was, yes, their judgment was based on works. Our judgment will be based on works. But it's unto salvation based on the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So he says here, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. So again, what happens to the person who does evil? Trouble and distress will come. Now, it may not happen now. You may not suffer consequences when you do something out of God's will or when you act Um, in opposition to God's holiness. You may not see any 
consequences here. But consequences will come, and trouble and distress will come, whether it's on this side of God's kingdom or whether it's in the presence of God. He says this, but glory and honor and peace to every man who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So what happens to the one that does good? And by doing good, we're talking about those that have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and the good works are being produced by Christ in and through them. So, and we see that for those individuals, glory and honor and peace come. So there's a strange thing in that verse. Paul says both times to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So what does that phrase mean? What is he saying here? Is he suggesting that the Jew has some sort of advantage in salvation or disadvantage in judgment compared to the Gentile? Well, really not at all. What Paul's saying here is he saw the Jewish people as a privileged people to whom God has given his covenant, to whom God gave the scriptures. And also the very gospel of Jesus Christ came first to the Jews, and then it spread out throughout the world to the Gentiles. Both Jesus and Paul took the message of the cross to their own people first, to the Jews first. So here's what Paul's saying. He sees that the Jews have a greater responsibility to respond to the gospel because it was presented to them first. And Paul explains that here, that he's not talking about partiality because in verse 11 he says this, for there is no partiality with God. So, so this is one of the statements that when he said that would have inflamed the Jews who would have understood that they were deserving of special treatment because they were chosen by God, because they were first, you might say. But Paul explains that the very law that they were given as a privileged people, as that they were privileged to receive, the very law only made the guilt of Israel that much greater. God does not show favoritism. His standards are the same for everyone, it's whether we've put our faith in Christ Jesus that determines our eternal fate. Not nationality, not gender, not position, or any other quality. Or any other quality. And as we continue in these verses, we see that no one, whether their sin is obvious, or hidden, no one. No matter your position in this life, your nationality, your gender, whatever, <coughs> excuse me, no one will escape the judgment of God. Verse 12, he says this, for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. So according to verse 13, who will be justified? The doers of the law, not just the one who heard. But this is important. The doers, hearing. We talked about this in Revelation right off the bat. It told us to hear the word, but also accompanying that word hear was the word heed. It's not just enough to hear. You have to hear and heed, hear and do. It's not the possession of the law. It's not owning the law written on a sheet of paper, owning the law written on tablets of stone, but it is the practice of the law that matters. Whew. And here we go. We're talking now about the law. And I thought with Jesus Christ we were not under the law anymore because Jesus fulfilled the law. Well, we're going to get in depth in that a little later on in this letter. However, a man is going to be judged by what he has had the opportunity to know. If he knew the law, he will be judged as one who knew the law. If he did not know the law, 
he will be judged as one who did not know the law. God is fair. God is fair. Now listen to this. Listen to this. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law, hear this, when the Gentiles who do not have the law, they didn't have it written on paper or on stones, it hadn't been given to them. When the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts. That's an extremely important phrase here, written in their hearts. Their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. Barclay, in his commentary, said this, Paul saw the world divided into two classes of people. He saw the Jews with their law given to them directly from God and written down so that everyone could read it. He saw the other nations without this written law, but nonetheless, nonetheless with a God-implanted knowledge of right and wrong within their hearts. Neither could claim exemption on the ground that he had a special place in God's plan. So our lack of knowledge is not an excuse. What is it? Uh, we say ignorance is no excuse under the law. Have you heard that before? Verse 16, he says, On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. Well, God not only sees our deeds, but he also sees our thoughts. He sees those things we attempt to hide from him, but we cannot. If you've got some things tucked away in the secret spaces of your heart so no one can see, know this, your heavenly Father, God sees it. He knows it. We might as well deal with it before him because he already knows it's there. Does your conscience trouble you when you violate the speed limit? I kind of chuckle about that. We have a street here in Gunnersville, Alabama, known as Sunset Drive. The speed limit on Sunset is 25 miles an hour, and it can be very difficult to, in our humanness, obey that speed limit, and particularly when there aren't any cars traveling on it, but we are without excuse. The reading of the law, the reading of the law was part of the Jewish daily life, but they couldn't keep the law perfectly. Only Jesus was able to do that. Now, the Gentiles, like most of us, we didn't, didn't hear the law, but God's law was written in their hearts in that they possessed a conscience, a sense of right and wrong, which they knew instinctively. And even they, even though we knew it, even if you know it instinctively, you cannot keep the law, the moral code, perfectly. No matter where we were born, where we grew up, what kind of family we had, we cannot be perfectly obedient, whether we had exposure to the Word of God or not. Apart from Jesus Christ, we all still stand condemned by God's law. Later in Romans chapter 3, verse 10, which we're going to look at next week, Paul tells us that there is none righteous not even one. So, as we move from this section into verses 17 through 29, this next section of Romans could be titled, Religious But Lost. Now, let me stop here a moment and tell you, I am flying through the letter to the Romans. We're covering a chapter a week, and that does not do justice to this letter. On some of the verses here, we could spend a full hour and more. Whole books have been written about some of the individual verses in the letter to the Romans. So please understand that. If you want to go deeper in much more detail, let me encourage you to study on your own. Go online. Look, there are wonderful commentaries and Bible teachers that are available on your phone, 
on your computer. And again, let me encourage you to explore it more in depth. So Romans chapter 17, verse 29, religious but lost. What are some of the customs and rituals that we follow personally or maybe in the church? I'm standing here in the sanctuary, the formal section here at Gunnersville First United Methodist Church. And in our traditional service, we have quite a number of rituals that we follow. Behind me on the altar, you see a white uh, linen uh, that's known as a pyramid. And periodically, the color will change. We change the pyramid with the liturgical or the church seasons. That's one of the rituals we follow. Every Sunday morning, we have two acolytes dressed in robes that will come down the aisle with lighters lit. They'll light the candles bringing the light of Jesus Christ into this room. And at the end of this service, they snuff out the candles, but they keep their lighters lit and walk out the back door, taking the light of Jesus Christ out into the world at the end of our service. We have certain times when we stand and sing certain things or recite certain things together. We have customs and rituals that we follow in the church. Well, Paul begins this section, and he begins by addressing the Jews, particularly those, it sounds like, who are in leadership uh, in the Jewish community. And we need to remember this. Paul was a Jew. He's told us before. I mentioned it in the introduction. He was a Pharisee among Pharisees. He was a follower of the law. And he trusted in his own righteousness prior prior to meeting Jesus Christ. And so he anticipates here that many of the Jews in Rome are going to balk at the idea of being considered as sinful as the rest of humanity is because he's going to teach for all have sinned. Well, wait a minute. We're a chosen people. We're set apart because of the law. And Paul realizes that this is going to be an issue. And so he's addressing the Jews and what they would have been taught and would have believed because they saw themselves as favored by God, religious, knowledgeable, models of morality, instructors for the foolish and the teachers of infants. Now remember, God indeed chose Israel. He chose them to be his covenant people. And you and I would not have the privilege of knowing Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior if it were not for the Jewish people who received Jesus Christ and risked their lives and many gave their lives to spread the gospel. Something They had something that no other nation could claim. God had given them the law. And he called them out to be separate, to live holy lives, and to be a light to the nation. So the question is this. Does the possession of such privileges as that and advantages guarantee a righteous life? So Paul writes, But if you bear the name Jew and rely on the law, and boast in God, and know his will, and approve the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of truth, You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that one should not steal, do you steal? You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law through your breaking the law, do you not dishonor God? So Paul is here zeroing in on the people who were the most religious in his day. 
And among them were particularly a group that he was part of, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes. And Paul is describing here, he's dealing with religiosity. And think about this. This can be applied within the church today. Our leaders, our teachers, our preachers, our elders, our deacons within the church. We can have this happen. This entire teaching that Paul is launching into here would have inflamed the Jews. And it would have inflamed the Jews against Paul. And as you'll see throughout Scripture, Paul was stoned. He was beaten. He was threatened. And of course, eventually, he lost his head because of what he taught. You know, maybe today we might use the word churchianity. A person who speaks religiously and performs religious deeds but lacks the true religion that's spoken of in Scripture. James talks about it in chapter 1, verse 27. And maybe this is talking about we have this outward appearance, but inwardly we're as lost as anyone else without Christ. Maybe you've heard this before, but sitting in a pew every Sunday does not make you a Christian any more than sitting in a garage day after day will turn you into a car. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. And Paul gives us this list of things that they were doing and that we do, we teach. But do we not teach ourselves? I'm going to tell you, I learn more by teaching than I ever did as a student. When I prepare these lessons, guys, it, guys and gals, it pins me to the wall. My heart is convicted. My sin, my shortcomings are revealed every time I prepare a lesson. Are we being taught by what we teach? So who else do we know in Scripture that approached the Jews in this manner with questions that were turned inward on them? Well, we see this very much in Jesus Christ's approach. He asked, do you not teach yourself? Do you steal? Do you commit adultery? Do you rob temples? We see that as Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. So we come down to verse 24, and Paul writes this, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Because of you. He's talking here about hypocrisy. During this time period when Paul wrote the letter, I found myself asking this question, what was the reputation of the Jews? What did the Gentiles think about the Jews during this time? And Barclay is a wonderful commentary that gets into the history and the events and what was happening during the times of uh, Paul and Jesus and the Old Testament figures. Barclay says this, the Gentiles would have regarded Judaism as a barbarous superstition and the Jews as the most disgusting of races and as a most contemptible company of slaves. And when I was reading this, you could actually, you can see uh, Hitler bringing forward some of those historical superstitions and hear that superstitions about the Jews. Plutarch, Plutarch thought that the reason Jews abstained from eating pork was that they worshiped the pig as a god. Lies, lies, lies. These were lies. But here's what they were especially accused of. Hatred of their fellow men and complete unsociability. Tacitus said this of the Jews in his writings. Among themselves, their honesty is inflexible their compassion quick to move. But to all other persons, they show the hatred of antagonism. The Gentiles had daily contacts with the Jews in business and other activities, and they were not fooled by their devotion to the law. They would encounter individuals that were highly religious, that prayed on a regular basis, 
that appeared to be devoted to God, yet would steal from them in a business deal. What are some of the things that outsiders see among us and in our churches that cause them to call us hypocrites? I've heard that over and over. I do not want to be a part of a church. It's just full of a bunch of hypocrites. And it's painful. Many, many years ago, I had someone in the congregation come to me and share with me about their encounter with someone who was part of the church, and they encountered them in their place of business where they were actually cheating and not being truthful, telling a lie, and how it so disturbed them. And they went on and they left this congregation as a result of that. Guys and gals, what do we do? We pretend to be servants and people of God and followers of Jesus Christ. And on Sunday, when we walk out of this building, we become different people. Maybe we go home and abuse our spouses. Maybe we go to work on Monday, mistreat our employees, and mistreat those and try to deceive those who come in to do business with us. We are without excuse. We are no better, no better than the Jews that Paul is addressing here. The group of Jews Paul is addressing possessed and taught the law, and they were breaking it. Now, Paul moves from here into a very volatile topic of his day and time, and it was the topic of circumcision. The Jews treasured circumcision. It was a sign and guarantee of the favor of God, guarantee of the covenant that they had with God. They also believed that those who weren't circumcised, the Gentiles, were rejected by God. So Paul comes here and he denounces physical circumcision as insufficient for salvation. Again, he's essentially denouncing religiosity. It doesn't matter what size cross you wear hanging on your necklace. That has nothing to do with your salvation. So he says this, For indeed, circumcision is of value if you practice the law. But if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. If therefore the uncircumcised man keeps the requirement of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? And will not he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you, who though having the letter of the law and circumcision, are a transgressor of the law? Have you ever heard this before? Christians are some of the meanest people on the planet, Non-Christians seem to be so much kinder. An example of this, on Sundays before the pandemic, as everyone would leave worship and go fill the restaurants in town, one of the things that I have heard said that waiters and waitresses just don't like the Sunday crowd because the people of the church are the worst tippers the most demanding and the grouchiest of all the servants that they, of all the customers that they serve. That's a shame. That's a shame. Guys and gals, we should be the best tippers. We should be the kindest. We should be the most complimentary. We should be the most patient. When you're in Walmart, in line, do you turn into a green-eyed monster or just some kind of beast because it can be frustrating? Or are you kind and patient toward those around you? The world is watching. And the whole church is judged based on our actions. Our hypocrisy does so much damage. So how had the Jews missed the point of what circumcision was all about? Circumcision or any other rite or ritual does not 
secure salvation. In order to secure salvation, the whole of the law had to be obeyed along with the circumcision, and no one, no one except Jesus Christ was ever able to achieve that. No one except Jesus Christ has ever been righteous enough to keep the law. Remember Abraham, and we need to go back into our Old Testament history. Abraham. Abraham was justified by faith before he was circumcised. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. Abraham was not circumcised until we get to Genesis chapter 17. Yet he was already righteous by faith before his physical circumcision. Circumcision was a sign of God's covenant relationship with Israel. It was a symbol of faith. Faith, yes, that must be present for salvation. But the tragedy is this. The Jews became dependent on the physical mark instead of the spiritual reality it represented. Hear that. They became dependent on on the physical mark instead of the spiritual reality it represented. Can we do this? Do we make the same mistake today? Do we do this with baptism? We depend on the physical act of baptism rather than the spiritual reality it represents. Oh, I was baptized as an infant. I don't have to talk to Jesus. I don't have to have that conversation with him and ask him into my life. I was baptized, so I'm good. I'm saved. It's not what the Word says. It's not what the Word tells us. I take Holy Communion every Sunday. I'm good. I'm taken care of. I'm saved. I don't need to worry about this Jesus thing. I've taken communion. Or maybe even church membership. Hey, I'm a member of First Methodist Church, Gunnersville, Alabama. I'm good. I don't have to think about God anymore. I joined a church. Wow. Wow. God judges us according to the secrets of our heart. Romans 2.16. He's not impressed with our outward and mere formalities. An obedient Gentile with no circumcision would be more acceptable than a disobedient Jew with circumcision. An obedient person without baptism, hear this, would be more acceptable than a disobedient person without baptism. Think about the thief on the cross. The thief hanging on the cross beside Jesus. Our understanding is he hadn't had the opportunity for the ritual of baptism Yet he looks at Jesus, and I'm paraphrasing greatly here, he essentially says, we deserve this, but you don't. Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus turns to him and says, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus was judging based on that man's heart condition, not the outward formality that he had gone through. Verse 28, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly. Neither is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. Oh my goodness. Can you imagine how inflammatory these statements would have been and even are today? Listen to this. He is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. It is because of this that you and I, Gentiles, can say we are children of Father Abraham. We sing that in our children's ministry. Um, I am one of them and so are you, so 
Let's just praise the Lord. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. It's not about the bloodline. It's not about the outward sign. It's about the heart. It's not about the fact that your mother or father was a Christian. It's about your individual heart condition and your relationship in Jesus Christ. So in contrast to physical circumcision, how is circumcision of the heart acquired? How do we get it? Let's get practical. Well, first of all, I want to say this was not a new concept. Paul wasn't writing something that was totally new. God himself taught this. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16, the Lord says this, Circumcise then your heart and stiffen your neck no more. Meaning a life that is separated from the flesh and unto God, or separating yourself from sin. The prophet Jeremiah in chapter 4, verse 4, talks about this. And the prophet is speaking for God. He says this, Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and remove the foreskins of your heart, men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my wrath, meaning God's wrath, go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it because of the evil of your deeds. So this was already taught back in the Old Testament that the true circumcision is a circumcision of the heart. We cannot live a life free from sin, apart from that relationship with Jesus Christ and a filling of his Holy Spirit. So how then do I circumcise my heart? Where does it begin? Well, it begins with a conversation with God. It begins with a time when you on your own talk to God about his son, Jesus Christ, and invite him in to your life as Savior and Lord, making a decision, not my will, but your will. There are three words I want you to remember. Those words are, I'm sorry, please, and thank you. Now, everyone's conversation with God about Jesus Christ is different, and it's unique to you, but it might go something like this, using those three words. You don't have to know uh, Scripture in order to begin that relationship, that walk with Jesus. But here, here would be a beginning. Oh, holy God, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I keep missing, messing up. I keep blowing it. I want to do things right, but I can't do it. Please, please come into my life. Please clean me up. Please forgive me for my sins. Please Save me and make me yours. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for what I've done, for the things I've done. Please come. Please come into my life. I need you. And maybe after you've had that conversation and said those words, you've stopped for a moment. You've expected some kind of big Hollywood experience, and you didn't receive that. I know I didn't when I asked Jesus into my heart as Lord and Savior. There was no flash of lightning across the room, no booming voice of God that shook the earth. The changes in my life were gradual. I became a Christian when I was very, very young, so I had no dramatic experience. But here's what we all need to do. If we've asked God that, if we've prayed that prayer, then our next thought would be thank you. Thank you for doing what you've said you'll do, for forgiving me for my sins. Thank you for cleaning up my life. Thank you for coming into my life, Lord Jesus. And if you've prayed that prayer, I encourage you to tell somebody. Somebody needs to be a witness for you. Or write it down in a journal somewhere or on a note somewhere on this day. I asked Jesus to come into my life as Lord and Savior, and I thanked him for coming. And here's why you need to tell somebody and why you need to write it down. Because as time goes on, as the circumstances of life start pressing in on you, there are going to be moments when you doubt, did he really come? 
Did I even ask him, did he respond? And you need to go back to that date. You can look and say, yes, I did. I'm standing on this. I'm claiming it, even though I don't feel you at this moment. Now, the moment you have that conversation with God, ask Jesus into your life as Savior and Lord, he comes into your life, into your heart, and he comes in the form of his Holy Spirit. Jesus told his disciples after the resurrection, he said, I'm leaving, I'm going back to be with the Father, but I'm sending something better. I'm sending the Helper. I walked around you, but now the Helper's going to do something better. I'm going to live in you. It is the Holy Spirit living in us that writes the law on our heart. It is the Holy Spirit living in us that brings about the circumcision of our heart, of our heart. And I would love to go into teaching about the Holy Spirit right here and now, but I'm not able to do that. But Pastor Ricky, in the near future, is going to be teaching on the book of Acts. And he's also going to be doing some teaching this summer on the Holy Spirit. So we'll be keeping you informed about that. In Acts chapter 15, Paul has gone to the Jerusalem council because there's, there's arguing even within the new Christian community about circumcision. And Paul has gone to the Jerusalem council and they have declared that circumcision was not necessary for salvation or for acceptance into the Christian church. But in chapter 16 of Acts, we see that Paul has Timothy circumcised because Timothy was part Jewish, part Gentile, and by going through the act of circumcision, it expanded his witness to both groups. And if we turn to Titus uh, and, and hear about Titus, we turn to Galatians chapter 2, 3, we see a Gentile named Titus that Paul encourages not to be circumcised because of his witness to the Gentiles. So as we conclude this chapter, again, it's not exhaustive. There's so much more we could study and learn here. What is the real mark of God's family? What is the real mark of God's family? It's a relationship with Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. I'm sorry. Please. Thank you. Jesus coming into our heart in the form of the Holy Spirit. When did your faith become more than ritual? Or is it still just ritual to you? Every week you just check the box. I went to church on Sunday. I'm good for the week. What customs do we have that need to become less of a ritual and more of a matter of the heart? When we stand together on Sunday mornings and recite the Apostles' Creed or recite the Lord's Prayer, are we just babbling words that we don't even give any thought to anymore because we've done it over and over and over again? Has that become just a ritual? Well, it needs to be a matter of the heart. As I conclude tonight, I want to conclude with this from Chuck Swindle. He says this, Think for a moment about some of the practices and traditions that have become a fixed part of the evangelical landscape in America. Defending the Bible is true, baptism and the Lord's Supper, scripture memorization, political activism, tithing, list of do's and don'ts, Christian lingo, church building programs, altar calls in worship services. Not all of these things in and of themselves are bad, Some are, in fact, vital to the life and ministry of the church, but can any of them save an individual? Yet some churches, by how much they emphasize certain aspects of religious life and downplay others, imply that these practices are more important than faith in Christ. Like the Jews who elevated circumcision over the faith it represented, We can elevate our rituals over true faith in Christ. Guys, if that's happening 
in your life. Let me encourage you this very evening to take some time to have a conversation with God and His Son, Jesus, about what's going on and experience the joy. Experience the joy of a relationship that is so much more than our ritual. Well, next week, we're going to be jumping in to chapter 3, and the subtitle of chapter 3 is, Are We Really That Bad? And again, keep in mind, Paul is trying to establish the fact that we need Jesus Christ, and we cannot be in relationship with him apart from his work on the cross. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this evening. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to email me, and I'll do my best to answer them. Dear Heavenly Father, we just praise you tonight. We give you all the glory. We thank you for your servant, Paul, who listened to you, was obedient to you, and wrote these words down in order to teach us today. Oh, Father, we need you. There is such need in our life. Please soften our hearts. Please move us from ritual to relationship with you. And we give you all the praise and glory. In Christ's name, amen.